I strongly believe that you agree with Timmy Dakolo that this great country, Nigeria, holds a very great promise and you will continue to believe in that promise that this country, we can truly make it a land of our dreams. Well, how can we do that when we continue to disagree on how we can run this nation? How can we achieve that if we continue to disagree on how we should manage the affairs of this great nation, Nigeria? Of course, uh, they say it is that uh, we should continue to disagree to agree. Have we been able to agree over the type of uh, system that we should uh, actually employ when it comes to the management and leadership uh, uh, management of this great nation, Nigeria. The issues of restructuring of this great country uh, continues to reverberate. The arguments are either for and against. Who are those who are not comfortable or favorably disposed to the restructuring of this great country? Why are they not ever disposed to it? Why are those clamoring and agitating for an overhaul or a restructuring of this great country? Uh, why are they calling for it? What are the reasons? What are the pros? What are the cons? At this juncture of our national life and history, why are we still battling about uh, restructuring? That is what we're focusing on this morning on the Daybreak Show Citizens Forum, 17th of May, 2000. And 17. I am Toby Joseph. And I am Agimario, who are here. Now, Toby, the conversers are restructuring mm -hmm. the campaigning for the return of the Federal Republic of Nigeria to the configuration of its pre-Mossi history. Mm -hmm. A time before Nigeria was balkanized into uh, what some termed as jigsaw puzzle of state, an era with strong autonomous and culturally homogeneous regions where Nigeria's patriot unit. Now, the structuring or restructuring crusaders proposed a measure of the third six states along the lines of the six geopolitical zones and empowerment of those zones to exploit the natural resources, thrive on their own terms, and pay tax to a weak central government. All right, I hope we're picking those words. Mm -hmm. Now, the rationale for the promotion of restructuring is the popular notion that the current pseudo federalist system is unsustainable because it is irredeemably flawed crisis prone and condemned to be a source of frustration to all of us hemmed in by its structures. Now, when we recall that during the last national conference, which held in May 2014, during former President Emily Jonathan's administration, the Committee on Political Restructuring and Forms of Government, you know, recommended that the presidency and governorship should be rotated among the geopolitical and senatorial zones, respectively, and the provisions should be enshrined in the electoral law and constitution of political parties. Now, this morning on Citizens Forum, we should also look at those issues. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you're talking about restructuring, if you're talking about, um, you know, geopolitical zones, mm -hmm. region, regions like we had uh, back then. The past, then, regionalism. Then, yeah, that's regionalism. How can we truly make this? Can this is... is is this really the solution? Yeah, uh, can we even can we can we even go back, back to, to, to that? that? Well, so the, it's a whole lot of issue, uh, uh, Gamera, just like you you mentioned. But one key question that I think that I want to begin to ask uh, proponents of restructuring is, what form is that restructuring going to take? Mm -hmm. You have issues of federalism, fiscal federalism. Uh, regionalism, resource control, uh, derivation principle, uh, and so many issues that you begin to work at, uh, look at. But you see, we, whatever form that is going to take, that is why we are discussing this issue, and we've brought someone very qualified to look at this issue with us this morning, uh, a former a commissioner of the state, former deputy governor, and of course, uh, a member of the National Assembly, the Seventh Assembly, to be precise, represented uh, Ogun East Senatorial District uh, at the, the Senate, Senator Abde Bengasha Fiukaka. You're welcome to the Deliberation Senate. Thank you. Good morning, listeners. And uh, let me, uh, on behalf of Roxy FM, the management, uh, wish you the 65th uh, birthday celebration. Thank right. you very much. Uh, Senator Kaka, restructuring once again. We've been on this for a very, very long time. When we mention restructuring, or when you talk about restructuring, 
What are you advocating? What are you talking about? Well, um, it is so simple. If uh, we are not reading meaning into the call, if we are very objective, we will know that um, it's so simple. It is those who probably have something to hide will see it as a complex situation. You know, when you have um, a structure, take it like a building, and the foundation is um, faulty, sooner than later, the structure will collapse. So we are on a very fragile structure, that is the nation called Nigeria. And um, when we started, fiscal structure now, we were having the Northern Protectorate and the Southern Protectorate. Later, it metaphorized into the Northern region, Western region, Eastern region, and um, Midwestern region was added. When Yakubu Gawan came, we had 12. Moritala Mohammed, 19, 20, later 21, and um, now we have 36. The question is, how far have we gone? During the period of the four regions, we have each region controlling their resources. And they are controlling that resources in a marvelous way that um, we have healthy competition amongst the four. So all they do is remission of um, royalty to the federal government from whatever resources that they derive. Clearly, the recurrent expenditure and uh, I mean the, um, what do you call it? the recurrent items, the concurrent items, and the exclusive items were clearly stated that only those things that banded us together were put on the exclusive list. But somehow along the line, when, with the military incursion and attempt at unification or necessary unification of the system, then things changed. The center became though tiny at the top, but very fat. Unfortunately, the component parts called states, um, I wouldn't know whether I would say it becomes very thin or becomes an elephantiasistically fat that it cannot move. So becoming a beggar nation. So in effect, what we are now seeing is that uh, with a faulty foundation, rather than using mud, to say we are amending the dilapidated structure. Some of us feel that for us to move forward at the expected rate, and like what is happening in other more civilized countries, we need to go back to the base. Go back to the base to see where we have gone wrong and how best can we restructure what we have. If you look at the um, the National Comfort Bear recommendation, the issue of resource control was extensively discussed, and they had consensus across all the geopolitical zones. So if those people are representing their people, I don't know, after that consensus, why anybody should be afraid of saying, yes, resource control. Every so, every state are endowed with reasonable resources. That if we stop stopping the states from going cap in hand to the federal government and they attempt to be a bit self independent, they will exploit those resources maximally and now contribute to the center. So, also is the issue of um, the exclusive uh, legislative list. Yes, we know that items like uh, the military, the interior, something bordering on our bond. Yes, we can retain them on the exclusive legislative list. But there are some that should be transferred to the recurrent, I mean to the um, 
concurrent, concurrent list. list. For example, if you look at electricity generation, our main problem now against industrialization and even the diversification of agricultural and mineral resources is electricity, energy. We've been uh, unable to tackle the problem. But when you look at it, some of the bottleneck that we are experiencing with it is the fact that we overcentralize the power under the exclusive control of the federal government. Come to think of it, virtually every one of us, we have generator. We generate our own electricity, even to read in our homes. Then if you can do that, and we are not sending those things generated, these generated from our uh, generator into the national grid, I see no reason why we cannot review the act establishing the energy, the energy commission to ensure that the state local government or even community could be allowed to generate their own electricity so that those are part of the restructuring we are talking about then you go for the education you keep on wondering what's the business of the federal government with primary and secondary education other than to formulate policy and then provide us with the implementation strategy on how the policy will be implemented allow the state, allow the local government to handle primary and secondary. And then we now see how each can move. Then we have healthy competition. Not that, okay, those who are moving fast will be held down while we are waiting for the snail coming behind, holding the whole nation down. Now, um, Senator, some of the opinion that um, true patriotism is what we need and not the structure. They are not exclusively, they are not mutually exclusive. Because if you talk of true, true metro federalism, you are talking of the component parts standing on our own. If I have a state and I'm in charge of a state, I should be able to determine to what extent I want to go in all these things we are talking about. So there is no much differences between what we are saying. The part of the restructuring is going back to true federalism, whereby we dismantle the unitary form of government that was fostered on us. Each state determines at which place they want to run, what their priority is all about. If, under a true federalism, if I decided to say, yes, education is not my priority, and I want to concentrate on agriculture, no federal government officials can come and tell me that compulsorily all the states of the federal should come and get ready to go and buy tractors. When my own preference is on education, when my own preference is on industrialization. So it's, it's interwoven, so to say. All right, you said something about um, consensus. You said that those who um, were at the last, um, that was 2014 National, National Conference of the Compact that they had a consensus on restructuring. So how on, can... on most, on most of the items contained in their report, it was by consensus. So Surprisingly. Can... Okay, how can we have some, especially those who are representatives from the northern part, coming out and saying that they were never part of it and that they were not duly um, represented, even in that compact, and they were they, they, they are actually against the uh, restructuring as we speak. Well, one thing is certain. The minority can have their say, but unfortunately, the majority just have to have their way. So, if by consensus, the majority agreed on most of those items, for anybody to renege or to try to deny that consensus, I think um, it's an unfortunate, unfortunate situation. So, as far as I'm concerned, even if we look at it, all those items are agreed upon. We haven't seen anybody coming out openly to give cogent reason why those items must not be adopted and implemented. None of them. Even when you hear the noise that is going on, listen to Atiku Abubakar, listen to Jerry Ghana, and so many others, they have embraced this restructuring we are talking about. They have embraced through federalism. 
talked about the faults of one system of government or the other. But what makes a system of government faulty? Is it the ideology on which it's built or the players of the system? Both. Um, well, unfortunately, in this country today, there's no clear court ideology. We are just zooming along. So, if we want to go into welfareism, we should be able to make it explicit. And if it is the extreme of capitalism, let us know. If it is centrist government we want to embrace, let us know. But right now, what we are trying to do is a situation whereby the elites keep on controlling the system to the detriment of the downtrodden. And people are saying this is unacceptable. Beyond that, some, uh, some part of the zone, some zones or region wanting to lord it over others and taking things as their birthright. So you will realize now that um, it's not only ideology, but also the players. The players don't want to play according to the rule of the game and don't want to respect the fact that where their own right stops, the right of others begin. All right, Senator Kaka, let us look at the one major issue. Uh, the Northern Delegates Forum, those are delegates to the National Conference, 2014 National Conference, uh, who are kicking against restructuring. Uh, if you look at their arguments, it seems they feel that when you talk of restructuring, you are trying to renegotiate the union of Nigeria. You are trying to call for a breakup of the country. How can you disabuse their minds if you were given that opportunity? Well, um, I believe that when you talk of northerners, we are making over generalization. The Talakawas in the north, the downtrodden, the middle class, the careless about all those rhetorics. Their main concern is how do we run a viable administration that provides them with basic necessities of life from food, water, education, shelter. Those are their main concern. Our problem is the elites. And they do all this not for lack of knowledge. Many of them they are well educated, their children are well educated, but because they benefited unjustly from the warped system, they want it sustained, and that's why they are afraid. They know that it's not easy to balkanize Nigeria, and nobody is talking of balkanization. It is when they fail to allow the people to have their way with the restructuring that they will actually be calling for balkanization. The earlier we restructure genuinely to enable us in unity move as a nation, the better for us. Now this comes, uh, th this calls to question the rationale of uh, the calls of uh, the call for restructuring uh, from even APC leaders, because I remember vividly when this 2014 national conference was uh, muted and organized by uh, the former uh, president Good of Jonathan. Uh, and some other leaders of the APC now kicked against it. Uh, the current president, President Mohamed Buhari, also was not in support of this national conference. Yet, uh, Nigerians are expecting this same administration, this present crop of leaders, to actually support a restructuring. Isn't that uh, <laughs> trying to uh, get uh, uh, an egg from the belly of the rock? That is the issue of ideology. Right now, we don't have any ideological divide, as I've said earlier on. In fact, if you look at both parties, APC, PDP, you can hardly note any differences. So, those people that were opposing when Jonathan was there, they were doing it simply for enlightened self-interest. Because they are calling for change, then it must be changed at all costs, and they must hold on to whatever in order to justify their stand against the incumbent. That is not patriotism. If you are patriotic enough, it doesn't matter. Even if your opposition 
he is doing the best thing for the nation. You should be able to embrace it, acknowledge it, and give the maximum support. Know that, okay, we say, okay, let, okay, I can assure you now that our leader, Bola Tinubu, that you mentioned, now seriously wants restructuring. He has been in the vanguard of restructuring. So it was an anomaly. Or maybe for other reasons beyond what the eyes could see, then he, he opposed, kicked he kicked it. against it. But it could be, it could be because of the composition of the national comfort there. But what, with, with what you have seen, you, you are a member of the you are an APC leader, uh, not only in the state but at the national level. Uh, do you look at the body language of Mr. President or his administration? Uh, do you see this issue of restructuring in the light of the day? If you think so, how? Is it going to come about? Obviously, we can't be organizing a new national conference. The report of the 2014 is still there. I doubt if it is if it is on the table of Mr. President as we speak. Well, um, whether we like it or not, I believe restructuring restructuring must be done. Failure to do it, we are calling for eventual. We are postponing the evil day which happen to be their fear of possible disintegration because you can't oppress a group of people whether at the zonal level at the state level even at the community level and get away with it without their consent the moment we still continue to run away from the problem rather than facing it and tackling it we continue to have the likes of Boko Haram the likes of um uh, militants and so on and so forth so to douse that tension what we need is not toleration we don't need to tolerate one another we need to understand one another by the time I understand your culture I understand what your religion is all about I understand what you stand for I understand what you want I should be able to reach a compromise that will enable us to balance the coexistence. Anything short of that is like putting two crabs. No, so, so, so I want to be very blunt uh, this morning. I can't be more than blunt. The body way, language, but, that, yes. that, this is a question. The body language of Mr. President, do you see him supporting restructuring? It's difficult for me to construct what is in his own mind by mere looking at the body or the face. But notwithstanding, I believe that Mr. President is sincere enough. I believe he's a committed Nigerian. I believe he could move Nigeria forward, minus the issue of nature that he's battling with. But he's also a human being. He's from his own. Whether we like it or not, he's a, I mean, he's a full animal. So, I am first of all a Yoruba man before becoming a Nigeria. He is also first and foremost a Fulani man before becoming um, a Nigerian. So the enlightened self-interest will be there. But in the overall interest of Nigeria and in his own interest, this revisiting issue of restructuring and finding amicable compromise amongst all the component parts. It's just not negotiable, I'm sorry to say. And when you look at it, it's, a, it's like sitting on the keg of gunpowder. All right, if what Nigeria, okay, Nigeria may need restructuring, but um, is the time ripe for this? The time is overripe, if I can tell you. Can you explain that why? Well, for example, How? we have balkanized the states into 36 states, and we held them down without allowing them to be a bit independent of the federal. They keep on going cap in hand. So if we want to make it, whether we want to group them into zone, like some people were advocating for, or we even want to add more states, so be it. But we should structure them in a way that they will have blood in their system. They will be able to generate their own resources, 
be able to act like a true federal component. So it is when we do that one that we can move forward. Then beyond that, don't forget that it's not only this issue of structure. Look at our civil service. Right from Morita Laoba regime, when they did the, the civil service reform, a lot of harm was done to the system. And right now, you discover that about 75% of our resources are going into the current expenditure. It, that one also requires restructuring on its own. Whereby, if we want to move forward, develop and grow, then we must find a way of getting more money into the capital expenditure. And those in the civil service must be able to work at the pace that can give us what is desirable and what we deserve. And this one applies to not only the federal government, civil service, the state, and of course, the local government. If you permit me, I will say that we even move to the uh, private sector. Any law that will make the private sector to be accountable to the people, we must not fail to do it. A situation where the banks will be smiling home every year with billions of profit after tax, when the function they're supposed to perform in the funding of the real sector of the economy is being totally abandoned and the government is looking elsewhere, then there's no way we can grow. We can only be growing on paper, not in the real terms. For us to have industrialization, the bank must function as expected. The NMPC, we have to restructure it. So a lot of areas needed restructuring. Maybe they don't understand what restructuring is all about. It's not about balkanization of the country, but on how we can allow the system to work eff effectively and efficiently. That is what restructuring is all about. All right, now, let, let me, let, we're talking about, um, you know, balkanization of the country. Now, let's take it from your own perspective because that is what Sam actually looking at. Now, what shape or form should it take, regions or zones, or the um, abolition of state? Because we already have 36 states now, and some actually calling for more state. All right. Now, if we have 36 states, and if more are created, what should we do? Should state be abolished, and then we just maintain regions? Are we going back to regions? Consider the fact that. Um, when Nigeria, you know, at the time of um, of um, independence, we're just about, I think, 40 point something million population. But now we're talking about over 70 million, about over 70 million running into 100, if not more than, or more than that now. What would you suggest by your own calculation? Well, uh, right now, our population is about 200 million. And the constitutional provision is for 774 local governments. Though we are having a lot of LCDA being created. So, with the addition of those ones, once it's accommodated within the constitution, then we'll be having over 1,000 of local governments. What we are saying is that the constitution made it possible for the existence and creation of local government to be the responsibility of the state. Even if you are going to zonal arrangement, let's say six or eight zones, that doesn't remove the fact that the states will still exist. It's because the state government, the state governor, is actually crippling the last tier of government, which is local government. That's why we are not having any activities going on in the various local governments. Whether we stay at 36, we increase it to whatever number, or even reduce it, whichever way, the bottom line is for effectiveness and efficiency. And to get that one done, there will be some modicum of autonomy at the local government level then the state also must be relatively independent, not over the line of the federal government. 
Be that as it may, it should be possible because when you go to advanced countries, you have different county providing their water, providing their electricity, providing their, what we call it, uh, fire services that are community-based and they are functioning effectively. I don't know why we should centralize our own. When you talk of fire services, you talk of agriculture, it will be at the local government headquarters. Security. Security, local government headquarters, and nothing is moving. We should be able to have something that will work for us, not just anyhow. But in any event, if it if needs be, if local government can be collapsed, and then let the federating units be too, so be it. But most importantly, the presidency we are even running is not too expensive. It's not accountable enough. And that's why people were able to escape with billions and trillions of Naira unnoticed. What was being used before was the parliamentary system of government, whereby for you to become a minister, you must have one election from your constituency. That is, you are true representative of your people. Now that some people will work within the, within the system at the state or federal level, and then those that did not know anything about the policy, about the manifesto, about anything, will just be brought from nowhere, in the, from the diaspora, and then they will be tossed on the people. There's no way. They will have eyes, but there's no way they can see. So all these are things that sincerity of purpose is required. If it is 12, if it is 20, if it is 36, even if it is 100 states that we have, once we have sincerity of purpose and we are ready to allow the system to work, then yeah, we won't have problem. All right, uh, because of our time, we have to take a break for the national news at 10. After the national news, we will come back and continue our discussion. Senator Gwenga Shafiu Kaka is our guest this morning. I've been looking at the issues of restructuring of Nigeria. Still, let's be back. Welcome back. It's still citizens for another day break show today, Wednesday, the 17th of May 2017. We're looking at uh, the issues of restructuring in Nigeria. We have in the studio of Senator Adebenga Shefiu Kaka, a former member of the National Assembly, 7th Senate to be precise. He represented Obo East Senatorial District between 2011 and 2015. He's also a former uh, deputy governor of uh, Ubu State. Um, Senator Kaka, we want you to quickly uh, look at the issues that are, or the challenges of states, as it were, battling with pension, pension arrears, salaries, salary arrears, and other entitlement and emoluments of civil servants. Many of them are given under. Uh, beyond that, the same situation is also playing out at the local government, who some have said are also mere appendages of the state. And they are not really functioning as a third tier of government. Can restructuring handle all this? Or before we even do a holistic restructuring, how can we need this situation in the world? Well, um, in the first instance, we have talked about um, state, local government developing at their respective level and stages. A situation whereby a local government executive or a governor of a state inherited areas of salary evidence that what he is bringing in is not adequate enough to even pay the staff talk less of making a developmental stride and the same set of people wants to go ahead and bring in as employee their relations their cronies thus further ballooning the weight bill 
That is one of their shortcomings. Then two, the unified system, whereby we are expecting River State, Akwai Bomb State, Lagos State, Delta State, to be paying the same worker as the Gawa, as Ekiti. Okay. Okay. You can see the floor. The job load is not the same. And yet, we want remuneration to be the same and unified. Then secondly, our provision is so loose that somebody will get into office instead of limiting themselves as a governor to probably 10 or 12 commissioners they want to have about 20 as many advisors as possible the question is what job are they doing some will not do anything throughout the four years and there will be an additional load on the post of the state or that of the local government if it is um, at the local government level at the federal level you will be amazed if a sort of analysis is done of the number of federal government staff that are living around in different states of the federation doing little or nothing throughout the whole year and they parasitically live on the post of the government so as far as state is concerned once they still realize that um, going to abuja to take ship money is the order of the day then they will have to make any efforts to say okay fine from our igr we can survive it's only Lagos state that is able to generate i think about 30 times of the allocation they collect from abuja the others the idr is probably not up to some not up to 20 percent and they have nearly equal number of workforce as Lagos state and they are paying the same salary so i do hand is the devil's workshop once the workers are not provided with the working tool in form of a capital expenditure capital provision so the next thing is after mopping up the recurrent expenditure then they look for whatever is left of the capital expenditure they are going to squander and that is why we have the state being held down All right, yeah. and that's why we said the restructuring is just not negotiable not only at the federal level if they are thinking at the federal level can we now say the same thing at the state that the state will be bacchanized if uh, we introduce restructuring we are talking of efficiency we are talking of effectiveness and they should look at it from the positive angle not necessarily from the negative angle you have established the fact that uh, many states do not have the wherewithal to sustain um, the economy but they have to go to the federal um, and then collect allocation from the federation account now if we're still considering restructuring for this you know issue this problem on the ground does that not mean that some states will be staffed in the areas of mines? I don't think so. Like I said, um, if you look at it closely, when you are in need, then you just have to devise a way through creativeness, through innovation, to get solution to your problem. It is when you are being spoon fed you become contented without wanting to work, without wanting to devise a way of getting things done. Lagos State did not just attend the height they are in now. It's because a foundation was laid, they were able to harness available resources, and they were able to develop the human capital that becomes assets to them. But in other states, what do we have? So, as far as I'm concerned, the less privileged state, once they are not having easy access to fund, and we give them opportunity to tap the resources around them, I'm sure they can be self-sustaining. 
and they also learn how to cut their cloth, how to cut their coat according to their cloth, not according to their size. Right. If they're able to do that, I'm sure they will be good manager. They are not being good manager, as simple as that. A situation where, um, what do we call it, a quiet bomb, will be taking security votes of, say, $2 billion per month, and Kano or Jigawa or Kebi wants to follow suit. You know, there's no way they can. Because they are not on the same pedestal. All right, we've often heard about the marginalization that's been the cry. We have so many ethnic groups, major uh, ethnic groups, minor ones, and all that. Now, if you're talking about restructuring, how does that solve the issue of marginalization? Does it help us end that cry of marginalization? Restructuring is bound to help in many ways. Even marginalization. Of course. Why are we talking about marginalization? We are the majority group tries to oppress the minority group. If you go to America, Alaska is about one of the smallest states in America. And it's having the equal status of a state along with California, which is about the largest. Area that are contiguous with similar affinity, either culturally, socially, can be brought together, not necessarily because we want to uh, make tiny, tiny states. If it involves putting the entire Igbo as a state, the entire Yoruba as a state, homogeneously put together, so be it. And then different people with different they develop at their own um, respective state. And even when they are together, those with different affinity with different language with the culture of different culture we should be able to give room for them to exist um if you look at it there's no reason when we compare it to what happened under the western region she forgot i will know what happened to be from Ikene. and assuming the premiership was zoned to remo if it is the issue of number and the issue of a land space and everything, it can at least about 10 towns will be picked before it can. But what was given priority was its ability to deliver. The IQ it possessed and the knack for performance. Hence, from Oyo to Delta, from Edo to Ibadan, Oyo, Nobody bothers that this man is from a tiny town. So that um, if we have mutual respect for one another, there should be no room for obvious marginalization. So give everybody equal opportunity and let them develop at their rates. The one that is moving faster does not need to wait for the laggard. It is the lagger that we double up to meet up with them. Uh, Senator Kaka, quickly, before we travel the studio lines, are you of the opinion or are you optimistic that if eventually the powers that be succumb to restructuring of the country, this continued agitation for realization of a sovereign state of Biafra would actually be quelled? Of course. What is happening is that, um, number one, they are feeling uncomfortable. Those who are agitating, it may not be all of them. They are feeling uncomfortable with the treatment being meted out to them. Whether the marginalization is real or not, whether it is perceived or actual, the next thing is to look critically into their grievances. And then just oppose it amongst what is going on with us. Because there is no area in the country that is not crying of agitation. So if everybody is crying for agitation, okay, let's put it on the table. Let's do critical analysis and then see how we can compromise amongst ourselves. Then determine whether we actually want to stay together. After all, if for whatever reason, I'm not satisfied with what is going on. Well, I have the right to agitate. So there's nothing bad in the agitation, but it must be done within the limit of their own rights and the limit of other people's rights. 
All right, so it's time for us to accommodate your own opinions and contributions on the show this morning. Good morning. Dr. Tonkom, I'm calling from Ashero. No, I don't uh, know. Senator. Good morning. I have to be very frank with you. If you, what you have just said now, brilliant. If you use it during the electionary campaign, you will lose. What you are saying is what happened, what we're thinking of the other time. We are now wiser. We are very wise now. Nigerians will not be carried away by this rhetoric. I'll tell you why. Let's start with the comfort issue. The comfort was handpicked by Jonathan and his cronies, and they put up this thing. Some people said they, they were not part of it, and it was not even subjected to a play decide. How can you now, because some people were picked, or because they are eminent people, they were picked, they are very important, so they speak for us. We never send them to any comfort. And if you wanted to authenticate it, then subject it to a play decide. Let us stop using this compass thing. Either you will, nobody will use it because I don't believe I was represented. So take it to a plebiscite first before we start talking about it. We are talking of restructuring. Sir, we restructure every day. All of us are restructuring. God has this where you can steal money and go away. We are restructuring because you can't steal money anymore. You can't. You can't steal money again like that. That is form of restructuring. We are talking of restructuring and when we restructure, you're about to go here, you're about to go to heaven. To go somewhere, no, sir. We are now more intelligent than that because the structure will not make a vice chancellor to steal money in the university in a state university. This is what we worry about. It's corruption. When we now put our finger on corruption, all the while we're fighting for marginalization, you are corrupting us by not giving us what is due to us. That is it. We are not investing in landmarks or regionalism or what all sorts of those fancy things. Those things don't mean anything to, anything to us. We people who live in who live in a Cheru. We don't. We are interested in things being done well. Let us get light. Let us get water. I don't care where you put me, whether it's in the region of Africa or region of uh, whatever. No, sir. Those are the arguments of the elite which you belong to. Not because the argument. That, argument. that was the exact thing I told you now. Thank you. When I said the Dalakawas don't know the difference. <laughs> All right. Let's take more calls. We better react later. Yes, I think there's the in, in our area. Thank you very much. Um, first a question for you, sir. Okay. Who do the name. Your name, the please. New, uh, Southern National Conference be convened to classify our brothers and sisters in the upper Niger because they complained they were not fully represented in the last event, uh, in the last one, especially when it comes to discussing this factory. So, what is your take on this, sir? Thank you. Hello. The contributors so far, and um, to a large extent, I agree with um, some of them, especially when we talk about the um, issue of Niger Delta. It is true that those from the Niger Delta are actually sovereign, and when we look at they are so called the so called marginalization of the Niger Delta. It is real. I agree that embezzlement and corruption is dominating the issue of marginalization there. But this was due to the failure of all of us, including myself and those of you that have made contribution. The Almighty God that situated the oil. He situates it in Niger Delta for the sake of those people in Niger Delta. By the time we tap into that natural resources and we now use to develop other parts of the country without due consideration for the degradation that is going on as a result of the exploitation, I think it's a criminal negligence on all of us, especially the past administration. And as a result, if it is possible, as it is been, it was being done during the uh, in the 60s, let them carry out the exploration and pay royalty to the federal government, to the federal post. Alternatively, the money being made there should not be given to the governors or to the community leaders. It should, be, it should be used to provide necessary infrastructures and amenities that will serve the common people in the Niger Delta. 
it is the work structure that is making it possible for some people without leaving a finger to just pick oil well coming from nowhere and then becoming multi-billionaire overnight. If that is the system we want to sustain, that is one of the reasons I said we are staying on the keg of gunpowder. Because those who are totally disadvantaged will wake up one day and rise against the injustice within the system. A situation where we perpetrate injustices, there's no way we can have peace. And if there's any peace, it will be the peace of the graveyard. Now, coming about um, people have been in government and out of government. I've said it here before, the minority will always have its say and the majority will have their way. When you are in government, you are working as a team, you make your contribution, it's clear for the generality to accept it or not to accept it. Happily enough, somebody is talking about the national comfort, that it was not well composed, uh, some people were handpicked, fine. What about those of us who are legislators? We were purportedly elected, and yet we keep on backing without actually by, by biting. So in this case, whether it is Mr. A or, or Mr. B that brings to the table a reasonable proposal, I said it earlier, that if our opposition, if you are in opposition and a government of the day is doing something that is commendable, you don't need to condemn it. Pick what is best. Somebody mentioned it here now that we can still make use of part of the national confab, not necessarily everything, so that we don't throw the baby and the bathwater away. It is easy to say, let's call for another confab that will please the northerners. When you call for such, then you produce something is not pleasing to the Easterners, it's not pleasing to the Westerners or the Middle Belter. Then you keep on repeating and repeating and repeating. If you know how much that was expended on that national comfort, I don't think any sane man will say, okay, such money should just go to the drain. Yes, let's assume that the, the manner of composing the something is, is faulty. And we don't need to look at Jonathan. What is best for our country is what we should look at. Something that will bring peace to every one of us. It's not easy that, okay, because we're outside the government. Even if I'm in government, I know my right from my left. If I'm outside the government, I know my right from my left. And God has given us the wisdom to know the difference. So as a result, truth is always constant. I, whether I'm out of government or in government, I remain, I've been constant for the last 30 years. And you can go and check my interview, my presentation, everything. You will know that I've been so consistent that it's not issue of being outside or being within government. So that's the truth and nothing but the truth. Now, talking about um, composition. Uh, okay, I've talked about uh, not being representative. I agree with you, it's not being representative, but that is not enough to say we will throw everything out, except we have superior argument. If there's any issue there that is disturbing, fine. Let's look into it. Corruption, there's no doubt that is part of the restructuring. If we're able to block all the loopholes, then things will be better. But the loopholes we are going to block, that we don't look at electricity, nobody, you and me, cannot go and tamper with electrical installation if you don't know the nitty-gritty of it. It is those people entrusted with the responsibility that normally perpetrate those things. Again, those, in, those, those of us in government, you find people today, they allow generator to come in, they allow those bringing generator in to sabotage the system and making us to be totally in darkness. Not only that one, the population is growing and we are not thinking that the megawatts being produced must grow. And if it's growing, then how do we what is required? All these are necessary things that we look critically at, not necessarily the geographical expression called state or local government. The main issue is what is our requirement? Where is our data to confirm that, yes, this is what is needed? And how do we get it? So if we can do that, I mean, I'm sure things will be better for all of us. Industry can grow. So, like I said, it's not issue of government alone. We should not look at governance. We should look at even the private sector, where a lot of things are happening to hamper 
the progress we, we ought to have made. Then um, I think there's fight against corruption. Beautiful idea. What they are doing is complimentary, and um, I commend the president for doing so. But we still have a lot to be done. A lot. There are still many elements that are passing through the eye of the needle. So if it's going to be tackled with proper restructuring, I'm sure things will be okay. If you go to what do you call it now, the uh, Port Authority, a lot of things are happening. Even the National Assembly are crying that some agencies are not presenting their budget estimates. Then if they are not presenting budget estimates, that means they can spend any amount generated. Most of them are revenue generating agency. So if you are not restructuring, we are not getting them to be more accountable, then there's nothing we can do. It's not only enough to block the sources of the something, but we must make them to work efficiently and effectively. That's what my submission work has been. All right, let's replay all these messages. Now, what is your take on Nigeria going back to regional government? All right, no reaction. Well, um, I thank all the people that have made input into to this discourse. And um, I want to assure you that our agitation for restructuring did not start yesterday or today. It's been a continuous exercise. Governance also is a, a continuum. So that um, where one ended their term, another set of government takes up. But what we are talking about is when you have continuity and you are able to blend the past with the present and the future. And that's what somebody was talking about, visionary leader. When you have a visionary leader who is able to walk towards justice, then you will have peace. You will have life more abundance for the people. And there will be synergy of purpose, not somebody putting it up, another one pulling it down. So this issue, um, maybe some people do not understand what we are actually talking about. We are, we are doing certain things in the usual way. And we are now saying that for us to move forward, even whether in or out, out of government, you now discover some deficiencies. The normal thing is for you to find a way of making it better. And that is what we are saying that we should improve upon. I made mention that it doesn't matter whether the idea is coming from your party or from the opposition. What is lacking in all of us is patriotism. If we have the fear of God and we are patriotic, once we see something that is good for the overall interest of the country, all of us must embrace it. But because some elites are interested in what comes to them, what gets into their pocket, what comes out from their mouth may actually be misleading. You can't take their words to the bank. Otherwise, you, you will be in trouble. So, in the circumstance, I still believe that we just have to look holistically, holistically at the nation and find a way to accommodate the wish and aspiration of all the components in, a, in such a way that everybody will have improvements in their way of life and then they will be contented remaining within the entity called Nigeria. So, say what you like. I doubt if there's anybody that will not agree that electricity is the engine room for our development, for our diversification, for our industrialization. And we have been battling with it for the past 30 years. As the population keep on growing, it's not being a caca that happened to be the president, nor the governor of any state, nor a local government chairman. So we can make our contribution, but the most important thing is let there be light. The multiplier effect is so enormous that it touches everybody. Due to we have refinery that have not been working. We have the NPC gulping our money, and yet four refineries could not work. For the past 
four or five years, I've been talking of the unnecessary wanton destruction of the so-called illegal refineries. It is published in the newspaper. I made mention of it on the floor of the National Assembly that rather than destroying thousands, if you cannot build a refinery for ourselves, what is stopping us from legalizing those illegal ones, license them, provide them the wherewithal, and even assist them in refining their process? Because if they are refining it illegally, though crude, but they are being able to utilize the product, then why can't we improve on it? Why can't we encourage them and then generate revenue therefrom? I said it, even last year, I said it before the vice president now gave a rubber stamp on it this year. So some of us are not sleeping. We are not idle. I'm not jobless. I'm a farmer and I'm proud to be one. So politics is my hobby, but uh, not a profession. As a result, we will continue to do our own best in and out of government and then let everybody do its own bit. Don't ask for what the government can do for you, but ask what you can do to add value to our nation. Thank you very much, all those who called. Thank you very much, those who sent messages and those who tweeted on the show this morning. We appreciate every one of you. Our prayer and our hope is that Nigeria of our dreams will actually materialize anytime soon. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Adivinga Shafika. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Because uh, yeah, I'm sure it's more of a sacrifice still after the long week uh, celebration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. The 65th birthday. Yeah. yeah. We appreciate you. All right, uh, that's our show this morning. I am Toby Joseph. <laughs>